Amen. Let's learn something tonight. You in the mood? That's only the third time I've done that today. The older you get, stuff just starts falling off of you. Right? So, maybe it'll stay that time. I don't know. Well, yeah, let's learn something. Maybe... Maybe what you learned tonight will make sense. Maybe it won't. But it's there nonetheless. Genesis chapter 7. Ask, ask the question. Are dates important to God? I mean like the fruit dates that you... No. Just days. God picked certain days. Like uh, this morning, I mentioned the memorial of the Passover. There was no uncertain terms. God said, you take a lamb, you set it aside. I think it was like two weeks. It was to be segregated. And maybe part of that might have been to make sure it didn't get any disease from the rest of the flock or whatever. Because that lamb had to be spotless. It had to be without any sickness, any blemish. If it had any sores on it, couldn't use it. If it had a spot in the wool, even if it was just a natural mark, it couldn't be used. It had to be pure white, no blemish whatsoever. And then on the 13th day of the month, they made the preparations for that. Then overnight, going into the 14th day of the month, that was the Passover. And that's when God set them free. And then every year after that, to commemorate that, they would have the same they would have a similar ceremony. They would set aside a lamb, 13th day. They would take it and they would kill the lamb and they would serve the lamb overnight, 14th day. Then the beginning of the 14th day was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during those seven days, there'd be no leaven found in anybody's house. They had to set the leaven out, no leaven in the dough. And I sort of take that to mean no leaven in their wine either. No leaven whatsoever. Jews this day, they serve leavened wine. I don't understand that, but they're wrong on a lot of things. So anyway, um, let me just kind of side saddle this just for a minute. Now that I've brought that up, if you look in Acts chapter 12... There is what some people say is a mistake in the King James. Rule number one, no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, somebody says there's a mistake, refer to rule number one. Now that works for us, but some people have to have proof. And um, I've told this story before. I was in Lansing, Michigan. And um, the, the meetings I did... For the Prophecy Club in Detroit, Michigan, Lansing, Michigan, those people were different. Some cases they were way out there, but there was always a lot of people at the meetings. Lansing, of course, is the capital of Michigan, and there in Lansing, um, I walked into the room, getting everything set up, and a guy comes over with this Bible. And he hands it to me and he says, have you ever seen this Bible? And I, he offered it and I didn't stick my hand out to take it. Touch not the unclean thing, right? And I said, is it a King James? And he said, it's based on the King James. And my mind said, that ain't the same. So when he finally opened it up and showed it to me, it was what's called a sacred name restoration Bible. They took every place where your Bible says the Lord took it out, replaced it with Yahuwah or Yahweh or whatever, whatever their pronunciation of it was. And I could tell there was a whole group of them. They were sitting in the back corner. And I asked Phil, Phil Barham was the guy running the meetings there in Lansing. He's a good guy. Politician, though, so he plays both sides. 
And I asked Phil, I said, how long has these guys been coming? He said, well, they come every meeting. And I said, you should, I said, I'm going to say this. I think you ought to get rid of them because I think they're dangerous. I said, I think they're here to proselytize the people that come to these meetings. Sure enough, I got done early, which is unusual for me, but God was in it. And I'm putting stuff away and I said, does anybody have any questions? And out of that corner, a guy hollers, what about Acts chapter 12? Just real loud like that. And I said, what about it? And he said, what about it? So I got to get my Bible out and look it up. And as soon as I saw the word Easter, I went, oh, I know who these guys are now. If you look and you have Herod, verse 1, now about the time Herod king, the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because, it, and he, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, where are we as far as the calendar is concerned? Remember, the Passover is from the night after the 13th into the 14th day. And once you're in the 14th day, you're in what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's seven days. So where are we? They were already in that week somewhere. Then were the days of unleavened bread. It was not Passover. You follow me? It was Passover comes the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover is one day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days after that. You follow me? So let's say they were on the 16th or the 15th. But they weren't on Passover. So, it says then in verse 4, When he, Herod, had apprehended him, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, these guys, I knew where these guys were going with it. Because they had determined that the King James Bible was poorly translated and that it had mistakes in it. You have to establish that in somebody's mind before you can shove on them your replacement of it, right? Because if, like John, John is King James, right? Well, I have something better than the King James. See what he said? No, you don't. But if I convince him that the King James is wrong, and I say, I've got something better than the King James. He goes, oh, that's what I want. Okay? So these guys wanted to establish. They thought they were going to trick me. And normally, they would have, because I'm not that smart. But God had prepared me a year before that. And I knew how to answer it. They were saying that the word Easter was a poor translation. It was wrong. Because they said the Greek word right here where the word Easter is, is Pascha. And every other place in the Greek New Testament where you see the word Pascha, it's always translated Passover. Always. Except here. Now why could it not be translated Passover? It's already over with. On the calendar, they had already moved past the Passover. Now they're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So let's say he arrested Peter on the 15th day of the month. He's not waiting until Passover is over with. Passover's already over with. He's waiting for the Feast of Unleavened Bread to be over with. Now... There's two possibilities for this. Uh, Pastor Cooley has done a little research on it. I haven't, so I don't know that he's right or wrong. I can't say he's wrong. He's a friend of mine. I would never do that. He said that the early church actually called their resurrection celebration Easter. Now, he may be right. We still do, right? Or 
there was a pagan holiday, the Feast of Ishtar, and it's possible that this is a reference to that. But it, it, if the translators of the King James would have called this Passover, then it would have introduced a contradiction into the text. And they knew better, because these guys were smart. Definitely smarter than the guys sitting on the back row back there. Okay? So I explained that, and, I, and I, then I got angry. And I pulled out my rod, and I went, I said, let me tell you people something. You people want to go to bed tonight believing that your Bible's true. And you've got a group of people here who don't want you to believe that. And I showed them from the Bible how they can believe that their Bible was right 100% of the time. So do dates matter to God? Yes, they absolutely. All right, now, Genesis 7. Because here's a date. And to me, it's curious. We're given a date for the Passover. We're given an exact date for, like, the Feast of Pentecost. Because it was counted 49 days after Passover, then on that 50th day. That's why they call it Pentecost. We're given an exact date for the Jewish New Year. We're given an exact date for the Day of Atonement in the Bible for the Jews. We're given an exact date for like the Feast of Trumpets. We're given exact dates in certain places. And when you look at the, the list of the lineage of the kings, as every king comes to rule, oftentimes it will say now in the 40th year of King so-and-so, uh, so-and-so became king over Judah. And he reigned like 20 and 3 years and he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, and then he died, and then... So they give these exact times in the Bible. There are exceptions. We are not given a date for the birth of Jesus Christ. We're not given a date. Well, give me a guess why you think. Huh? Possibly. Yeah, that's, that's a big point. A lot of people are making a lot of arguments on things that are not in the Bible. Don't pay attention to it. If God didn't say it, you know what he's saying to you? Quit worrying about it. It's not important. Focus on what is in here, not what's not in here. Or not what you think should be in here. Yeah, we would celebrate... I guarantee you somebody would make that some big high holy day where you couldn't do anything. So we stuck December 25th on it. Somebody did. But we all know that's not Christ's birthday. So can you celebrate Christ's birthday any day you want to? Do you have to celebrate Christ's birthday? Not a commandment to. You don't have to if you don't want to do it. Okay? It's by choice we do it. So some dates he gave, some dates he didn't. We know Christ died at Passover. He's fulfilling the role. He is the lamb. Amen? And he fulfilled it at Passover. So now, in Genesis 7, 11. Go, let's go to 7, 11, all right? Let's get a big gulp of this, all right? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. So he's given us, for some reason, he's given us the exact day of the beginning of the flood. And then, if you turn over to Genesis 8, verse 4, it says, The ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, that's not the day that uh, Noah and his family left the ark. Because the waters were still going down. But the day that the ark rested on somewhere in the range of Mount Ararat, it was the 17th day of the month this, and the seventh month. Now, if you look at the bottom or the last verse of Genesis 7, you'll see that that's correct because it says... Verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. So we're given the date, the beginning, 17th day of the seventh month. If you were to count 150 days, you're going to land 17th day of the seventh month. Now, 
to make that possible, every month would have to have 30 days back then. My theory is, I think that the earth and the sun, I think a year was 360 days. I can't prove it. I'm not saying absolutely this is it. Yes, sir? So February the 17th to July 17th is 150 days? That's interesting. Okay. But anyway, um, just a little guess. But he gives the 17th day. And he does it, I think, for a reason. So we're going to study a number. We don't do this often, but we're going to study a number tonight. All right, let's pray. Father, we ask God that you bless us. Father, there's something you have to show us in everything in the Bible. And Lord, maybe I'll do a good job, maybe I won't. But Father, I, I think the things that you have in your word, no matter how small they may seem, they all have a meaning. And Father, we want to learn, we want to know. So we call upon you and we ask you to show us great and mighty things that we know not. So we believe, Father, what Jesus said, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So I believe, Father, that there's something relevant to Jesus coming and this particular number. So I pray, God, that you would show it to us and give us light, and give us understanding. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. So, so I look at this. Thank you, God. From an, make sure, I'm going to try to do it right, I promise. <laughs> okay, from a number standpoint, I, God, years ago, I'm studying numbers. I had two books, one by E.W. Bullinger, which was written late 1800s, another one on Bible numbers written by uh, independent Baptist evangelist Ed Velo, and I read both those books, and I read what he said, or both of them said the numbers meant. And sometimes those two guys agreed, sometimes they didn't. So I closed both those books and I said, God, you show me what they mean from the Bible. And I don't mean to challenge anything Velo said or Bollinger said. I just mean to add to it. So what, why did God pick this particular day? I think it's because of what the number 17 means. So go to the 17th chapter of the New Testament, which would be Matthew 17. That's easy. That's you can count that, but that's an easy one to count. It's in Matthew, 17th chapter. And here's what happened in the 17th chapter of the New Testament. Matthew, actually, I'm, that's not what I have up here. Why don't I have Matthew 17? Where do I have that? There it is. Matthew 17. Look at verses 1 and 2, but we'll read a few more. And after six days, why did he have to say after six days? Because I think it means something. How, many, how much is a day? How long is a day? A thousand years. Could be 24 hours. But a day is a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day, and a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And then he said in Psalms, A, thou, a, day, in thy, a day, O Lord, in thy sight is as, a, is as yesterday. Or a thousand years is as yesterday. So after six days, we have, I think we have a prophetic time frame. Six thousand years. After 6,000 years, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother. How many do we have here? We have four people. One of, them's, one of them's fixing to be different than the other three. Amen? Fixing to be. And he bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Mountains always, when you go up, the top of the mountain always represents heaven. A valley, what would that represent? Hell, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. So the places mean something. In verse 2, he was transfigured before them. A change took place in him. He's different now than he was before he went up there. He was transfigured before them and his face did shine. How? Because who is he? Malachi said... He's the son of righteousness, S-U-N, son of righteousness. The Lord thy God is a sun and a shield. 
So we know that Moses, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, was he changed? Because when he comes down, how, what's his face look like? It is shining so bright the Jews can't look at him. It's like, ugh, brighter than those LED flashlights. Brighter than, because you can't stand to look at those, can you? Those are bright. Brighter than that. 20 billion lumens. He's shining out on everybody. And the Jews said, cover his face. We can't look at him. And that is a meaning. That has a meaning to it. Because now the Jews, they're reading the Old Testament, but it's covered. It's got a veil over it. And they don't understand it. So all of this means something. And look at what, uh, well, look at what they, they're, they're uh, verse 3. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Two witnesses. Now, I don't know if they're the two witnesses of Revelation, but they're two witnesses. And by the way, both these guys have already been to heaven. Okay? Moses died and went to heaven. Elijah didn't. He left without dying. And they're talking with him. Can you imagine being Peter looking at this going, that's Moses. That's Elijah. And they're talking and you're going, what are they talking? I want to know what they're talking about. Uh, and uh, so verse 4, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, he's shaking. You got to know Peter's shaking. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud. This is what Peter said in at 2 Peter 1. A bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which is what we just heard a while ago which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And Peter remembered that. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter said, whose voice we heard when we were with him on the mount. But he said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. So understand this. What would it have been like for, let's say, any one of us to be Peter? And here we are watching Jesus. His face is shining like the sun. And all of a sudden, there's Moses and Elijah, and they're all talking. And you're watching this. You're seeing people that you only read about as a child and, and you know, fantasized over. Here's Moses and Elijah right in front of you. And you're just in awe. And then, to top it all off, you hear God himself, audible voice, saying, This is my beloved son. Right? How awesome would that be? Right? You've actually got something more awesome right in your lap. Peter said it. I, we've got something better than what I heard. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Amen? So if what Peter saw and heard on that day was glorious, what you have in your hand is more glorious than even that treat it that way treat it that way amen uh go to matthew 24 this is you know the meaning i read this i mentioned this a while ago in the prayer matthew 24 36 but of that day and the hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only and don't take anything i'm saying about this date that he gives in Genesis, as me telling you, I think that's the date of the rapture. Don't do that, because I'm not doing that. You guys know me. I haven't date set ever. Well, I did early on, years ago, but we're going to forget about that, okay? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming son of the man. So I think the Bible's telling us that the number there is important. The number is important. So, uh, even First Peter chapter 3 says this, Noah... And the flood represent what that number 17 represents. It means transformation. A change took place. When Noah gets on the ark and then comes off, they were both on the same day, weren't they? 17th day of the second month, 17th day of the seventh month. God picked that day. Okay? So Peter says this, which sometime were disobedient when once the long surfing of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Salvation is a transformation 
process. Amen? So, Sterling, the night there in your house, Brother Golf and Brother Rakeup was there. You've told me this story. They came and talked to you about Jesus, read you the scriptures, asked you if you wanted to give your life to the Lord that night, and you did. A change took place in him. The old Sterling, which you're not looking at, the old Sterling died that night. A new Sterling was born, and that's what you see now. So you don't see the guy that he used to be. And I won't tell you what I know he was back then. Maybe I don't know everything. But he's a different man now. A change took place in him. Somebody say amen. And that same change is what happens in each one of us. God changes us. Whereas before, all we want to do is go sin. We get saved. Now all we want to do is fight off those old sins. Get away from them, amen. So that's what that means. So verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, but not water baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. See, you're, even your conscience gets changed. Whereas before, you know what you did and you know it was wrong. Now, even though you know what you did was wrong, you also know that God has forgiven and washed away all of that. Just like God, what do you think God did? He cleaned the earth of all the sinners, didn't he? All the wicked people that were on the earth and all the giants that messed up the DNA of mankind, God wiped them off the face of the earth. He's cleaned this world and he changed it. So what that's a picture of, is what God's going to do at the end of time. A new heaven and a new earth. And that new earth is going to be sin free. Not free sin. Sin free. Amen. He's going to change it. Amen? Uh, turn to Acts chapter 2. See it here. You're going to see it here. Acts chapter 2. Was there a transformation? Uh, remember Peter, the night Jesus was crucified, what was Peter doing? The night Jesus was going to be crucified, the night he was being judged before the day he was going to be crucified, what was Peter doing that night? Huh? Falling around watching him, but every time they'd ask him, didn't we see you with the Nazarene? No. Well, you didn't see me. Are you sure? Because I'm pretty sure I watched you with Jesus. No, you didn't see me with Jesus. Uh, I think I did. I think I saw you with Jesus. Blankety blank, blank, blank. No, you didn't. He cursed. Got angry. And then... <laughs> and he remembered what Jesus said. You'll deny me three times. Can you imagine how his heart must have sunk? Then after that, he knows Jesus is resurrected, but Peter's given up. He said, I'm going fishing. And Jesus sees him out there on the boat. He says, Peter, come on. So here's this guy. He's afraid to be caught with Jesus because he knows Jesus is going down. And then even after the resurrection, he's ready to give it in. Go back to his old life being a fisherman. But on the day of Pentecost, ain't the same Peter. Look at it. Acts chapter 2 verse 3. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed. And think about the change now. Here are these, all these Jews speaking Hebrew or Aramaic, whatever they were speaking. And now all of a sudden, something that God said all the way back in Isaiah is about to come true. With stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. Look, so look. Behold, they were all mace, marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? 
And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So then he gives a list of the languages that were being spoken. Guess how many? 17. Exactly. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. 17 languages. And now there's, a there's more than one change taking place here. You've got Peter coming out, verse 14. Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said, this was not the old Peter. The old Peter ran away every time. The new Peter, this is why Jesus gives him a new name. He was, what was it, Cephas, Simon? He was Simon, but he said, thou should be called Cephas, which means a little stone, okay? Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So now Peter's a new man here, and he's preaching the first sermon of the new church age, new church dispensation, or whatever you want to call it. Peter's preaching the first sermon, three thousand people get saved that day and they're all hearing in gentile languages you see the change that took place go to uh well we did matthew 17 go to the 777th chapter of the bible i bet i'll beat you to it actually go to uh genesis 17 let me show you that change then I'll show you the 777th chapter of the Bible. Those of you who have the Pure Bible Search software online, you can look at, you'll find it. It's easy. You just click. I'm telling you, you have it a lot easier now than I did when I was counting this stuff by hand. Okay? Uh, Genesis 17. Look what takes place here. Abram. Look at verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now Abram is different, is he not? He's not Abram. He's Abraham. And then look down at, um, oh, Sarah gets it too. Verse 15, God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And here's what's interesting about it. You believe this or not. What he added was the Hebrew letter He. And it's the only letter that's all breath. <sighs> you get that? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on his disciples. <sighs> Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So what happened with the name, God's now given him the Spirit. And now Abram is a different man. Now he's Ab And notice, before Genesis 17, Ishmael is born. After Genesis 17, Isaac is born. Ishmael was born to the old man, Abram, Abram. Isaac born of the new man, Abraham. You see it? Isn't that neat? I like stuff like this. This is God's order. God does, he's perfect. And he puts everything in order. He, he even tells, we read it this morning. He says, when you lay out these 12 loaves, this is how I want it. I want six here and six here. So do you think the Levite just went like that or dumped them out? No, they set them down like that. Because if there's anything Jews do, they do it in order and they follow rules. And they did it exactly the way God told them to do it. God's a God of order. And it was so good to have uh, Ray with us today. And he, he asked the question, he said, will I ever, will I ever like think 
like God? I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. And I said, you read this Bible and start asking God questions, he'll start giving you answers. And all of a sudden, you start thinking the way God thinks. And you start seeing things the way God sees it. By the way, God sees everything black and white. It's either right or it's wrong. It's either good or it's evil. And there is no gray. Now, we have a lot of gray areas. That's just our nature. But the more you read this Bible and the more you start thinking like God, what used to be questions and gray areas to you, all of a sudden now you see them the way God sees them. It's black and white, right and wrong, left and right, up and down. That's how you see it. So now, 777th chapter of the Bible. Jeremiah 32. I just like to, I like that number. 777. What does that mean? What does 7 mean? Perfection, completion. So God puts a story in this one chapter here. And the number 17 is here. And it, you can see it plain. It's not something you've got to work on to figure it out. It's actually in the text. Jeremiah is in prison. And God is, remember Jeremiah is the one that God showed him, Israelites or the Jude, Judah was going to be taken over for 70 years. God showed Jeremiah that, Jeremiah wrote it down. When Daniel was in captivity, he was reading Jeremiah to figure out, hey, we're going to be here 70 years. Then God's going to let us go back. So Jer Jeremiah 32, God is angry with Judah. He's very furious with them because they've turned to idolatry. And God says, I'm going to put you in prison for 70 years. Your sentence is 70 years. I'm going to send you to Babylon. You're going to have your rights taken away. You're going to have your land stolen. You're going to have your vineyards taken. And there's nothing you can do about it. I'm going to do it. But I'm only going to do it for 70 years. And when 70 years is up, I promise you, God says, I promise you, I will let you come back to your land and you get your inheritance back. But because you didn't keep my Sabbath, the land's going to keep the Sabbath for 70 years. So he, God wanted them to have a sign that he was promising. It's like God saying, I therefore swear by myself, I promise I will give you all your land back. Signed, God. And he wanted them to know that he meant that. So here's what he does. He tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, call your uncle. Tell him to send your cousin out. He's got land that you can actually purchase because you're a near kinsman. You have a right to redeem it. And he said, you're going you're gonna to buy it. So he's, he, he's, verse 8, So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, By my field I pray thee that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Because God had already said, Guess what? Your first cousin's going to come to offer you land. I want you to buy it. Sure enough, exactly what God said. So verse 9, I bought the field of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. There is a reason why. So let's pause right here for just a minute, and let's go back in our minds to Acts chapter 2. What was happening in Acts chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, God was going to do, he was going to start the process of doing exactly what he said he was going to do. I'm divorcing Israel. I'm divorcing them. I'm done with them. Jesus labored among them all his life. Some of them loved him, but most of them hated his guts, and they said, crucify him. And God said, okay. So on the day of Pentecost, all of these people, you got all these Jews in Jerusalem because it's Pentecost, but these disciples are not speaking Jew language. They're speaking Gentile languages. And what did Paul say about tongues in 1 Corinthians 14? Tongues is a sign to them that believe not. 
that's Israel. The tongues was a sign to them, I'm finished with you temporarily. So remember how many languages they spoke? 17. Here we have the land being bought for 17 shekels of silver. They connect because God is saying the same thing here. I'm done with you. I'm, I'm finished temporarily. You know, he says in Isaiah 54, for a little moment, for a little while, I had wrath on you or something like that. But then with everlasting kindness, I love you, I forgive you. And he's saying that here. So follow this. So in verse 11. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. Remember, we have two prophecy books in the Bible. Daniel, Revelation. One of them sealed, one of them's open. Right? Same thing here. One of them is sealed. It's just like, Sterling, you've got the deed to the land that you own. Let's say in a lockbox somewhere, right? You have access to it. Somewhere. somewhere. Okay? But if you lose that, there's another copy somewhere, isn't there? It's at the courthouse. So there's two copies of the title to the land that you own. One is sealed at the courthouse, and it ain't going to wear. And as long as those records are allowed to survive, those records will be there forever. But then one's open where you can get to it anytime you want. Same thing here. Two witnesses, right? The book. Amen. So look at verse 13. And I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Verse 15, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let me put this up on the screen. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. God said, I'm taking you out 70 years, but I swear to you, I will, with my great mercy and love, bring you back to this land and you can own it all over again. I promise. And he wrote the evidence of that purchased with 17 shekels of silver in a sealed book and an unsealed book. And where did he put them? In an earthen vessel. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Who's the earthen vessel? It's us. Yay! He gave... The evidence that Israel is going to get their land back to us to keep it for them. Man, I love this. Because you know why? God found people, Ron, that he could trust. Do you change what you read in the Bible? You make it say something different than what it says? Would you let somebody change the deed to your house? Would you let somebody change your marriage license? No. You wouldn't let them take her name out and write somebody else's in? No. no. So God found people that he could trust. And he gave us this book and put it in an earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So don't get cocky about that. Be thankful, because really all you are is just a jar. Right, jar? Or a jar head made out of clay, made out of dirt. That's it. Ephesians 1, verse 13 in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, 
ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. He's referring to the story in Jeremiah 32. The, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So guess what? When Hanamiel comes back from Babylonian captivity, he gets his land back because that was the law, right? Even though Jeremiah bought it, he only gets to keep it until the Jubilee year. Then it goes back to the one who inherited it. See, I like this kind of stuff. To me, it makes the doctrine make sense. God took the most precious thing and he gave it to a bunch of rednecks, a bunch of Kenyans, a bunch of Koreans, a bunch of Indians. We got people from India watching. A bunch of Australians. Even a few Canadians. He gave it to us to keep until he comes and he starts unsealing that book. And when he unseals it, guess what's going to happen? A change is going to take place in Israel. And they're going to believe the one whose face is shining like the sun. They're going to believe it. See, I just, I love Israel. Joseph did too. Joseph, Joseph is 17 years old. Why do you think the Bible gives you that number? Because when he's 17, he has a dream about his father and his mother and his brothers. And he says to them, you're all going to bow before me. And they killed him, or they tried to kill him over that. They sold him into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Then he ends up in prison. Then he ends up being the second in command over the whole world. And guess what? 22 years after he's 17, now he's what age? 39. That's the number of books in the Old Testament. They're bowing to him, but they don't know it's him until he says, it is I, Joseph, be not afraid. Then he reveals who he really is. And Israel right now does not know that Jesus is the Messiah. God has hidden it from them on purpose. But one of these days, God's going to show them and they're going to believe it. Whew. I love this stuff. This is what God's going to do. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, give us light, give us understanding. This Bible is full of things just like this. When we follow the symbols like a scarlet thread or a stone or a lamb or a number, we follow these clues that you left in broad daylight. Right in your word. And through that, God, we, we see Israel, these Jews, these awful, terrible, Kabbalistic Jews. We see them the way you see them. Because you've never stopped loving them, ever. They were your people before, and they're going to be your people again. And of that, I have no doubt. And I won't argue with anybody about it. They are your people, God. And you're just using, you saved us and we thank you for it, but God, our place is to hold on to their promises until they're ready to receive them. And then we'll be glad to aid you in showing them they're still your people and you're still their God. And we will rejoice like the angels in heaven rejoicing over one lost sheep. The Father, we love you and we thank you, God. 
open our eyes. Help us to behold wondrous things from your law. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.